Hello, and welcome to another session of Introductory Statistics. In this session, we are very much continuing the ideas that we learned in the last session that was about the normal distribution. And in this session, we're going to talk about the sampling distribution, which we hope will be a special type of a normal distribution. Like last time, we want you to be ready with your formula card, calculator, and lecture notes. And possibly, if you want to, uh, also have the Draw Me a Picture document that you had from last time. You can print another copy if you've used up all your little spaces. Uh, this time, though, I want you to mark out everywhere it says sigma and write in sigma divided by the square root of n. So um, you'll have that sigma symbol, and then you'll do divided by, and then you can do the square root symbol. Um, and then lowercase m for our sample size. So really, the theme of this chapter is instead of sigma, use sigma divided by the square root of n. And the division symbol and the square root symbol and n are by far the thing that most students will forget the most. Uh, so if you miss problems on the chapter 7 quiz, my recommendation uh, is to go back and look at that quiz and see if there's anywhere where you maybe forgot to divide by the square root of n. Uh, and speaking of quizzes, if your chapter 6 quiz, if your normal distribution quiz was not the score that you want on your midterm or final exam or the final score that you want for the course, then I would encourage you before even watching this video to go back to the chapter 6 sampling dist uh, normal distribution video and rewatch that video working the problems with me as you go um, as really I would do in every video is to, to pause and work the problems with me as we go and then going back to the chapter 6 quiz and trying to understand every single problem that you missed being sure to message me if there are any problems that you can't understand why you missed the problem, uh, and I hope that you can get that done before the midterm exam to improve your score on the midterm exam. And really, preparation for the midterm exam, I would do that for every chapter. Um, go back over the quizzes and make sure you completely understand any missed questions on the quizzes. That's great preparation for the midterm. That's great preparation for the final exam, too. So I would definitely recommend that. Um, and then coming into Chapter 7, if you have a firm grasp on Chapter 6, your Chapter 7, this sampling distribution chapter, is going to be much easier. If you do not understand normal distributions, it's going to be a real struggle for understanding sampling distributions because we're going to use so many of the same concepts, ideas, formulas, and so forth. Okay, so let's talk about what a sampling distribution is. That's the name of this chapter. Uh, let's talk about what it is and what it's not. To understand what it is, we've got to understand that there are actually three different distributions that we care about. The population distribution is all of everything. Remember we talked about populations all the way back in chapter one and then samples were small subsets of the population. So um, here we've extracted our first sample and it, we're calling it x bar one and the mean of this first sample would be x bar and we'll, we'll say one to uh, say that it's different from this x bar because our our 30 data values, or whatever our m is, here are going to be different from the 30 data values that we have here and different from the 30 data values that we have here. Um, so this will have a sample, a specific sample mean, and it will have a specific standard deviation, and we can call it S1. Um, the mean and the standard deviation for the population, we use the Greek letter mu and the Greek letter sigma for the population mean and the population standard deviation, and we talked a lot about that in the last normal distribution chapter. Um, so that's for populations, mu and sigma. For samples, x with the bar on top and s. And then for sampling distributions, what the sampling distribution is, is it's the distribution of all possible x bars. So um, if we were to draw out, let's say that we had 30 data values here, if we were to draw out a histogram and put a curve to that histogram, um, we might have like a right skewed distribution here, um, and we would be very likely to have a right skewed distribution there if our whole population was a right skewed distribution, for instance. Uh, so usually the sample will mimic 
the shape of the sample will mimic the shape of the population, and then the sample mean will mimic the mean of the population, and the sample standard deviation will mimic the standard deviation of the population. For the sampling distribution, the mean of the sampling distribution works out that it's going to always be exactly the same thing as the mean of the entire population distribution. So we take this sample mean and we put it here, and we take this sample mean and we put it here, and we take this sample mean and we put it here, and they're all of the same size n. And really, we may have thousands of x-bars along here because the sampling distribution isn't just a handful of sample means, it is every single possible sample mean that's of a set size. So let's say we have um, a, a Austin P students. There are 10,000 Austin P students. And let's say that our sample size is 30. Um, so if we go and we, we gather 30 random people, um, that's one sample. But if we change just one person in our 30, then that's going to be a different sample of size 30. And if we change another person, a different sample, and another person, a different sample. And then we could change all 30 of the people, and so that would be a different sample. We could probably do that um, a whole bunch of times, because uh, whatever 1,000 divided by 30 is would give us how many times we could find 30 completely different people. Um, but even just changing one or two people will be different as well. So I suspect that there are at least millions, if not billions or trillions or quadrillions of samples of size 30 from all 10,000. Uh, we would actually do, I think, 10,000 choose 30, um, and that would give us an enormous number uh, of different combinations. So you've got a, almost an almost infinite amount of X bars here. And it turns out, if your sample size is large, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, that we will know that these distribution of sample means, oops, um, the distribution of sample means, we will know it's normal if we've got a, a large, so we'll, we'll have this nice bill-shaped curve. So even if our uh, sample distribution, our data distribution, and even if our population distribution are skewed, right skewed, left skewed, um, not symmetrical, uh, even if that's true, we could still have a normal sampling distribution. So that's really awesome. Oh, one other thing I want to point out is even though the mean is exactly the same as the population mean, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution gets smaller and smaller the larger our m is. So if we have a large sample size, then that's going to make our sampling distribution be narrower. Uh, so if n of 30 would make it pretty narrow. If we made the sample size 100, that would make our distribution even narrower because we are dividing by the square root of n. Uh, and like I said on the first slide, um, this is the big difference between chapters 6 and 7 is that we divide by the square root of n, so you'll see this a lot. <laughs> For example, on this slide we see lots of dividing by the square root of n. Um, and so here uh, are the formulas that we have for the sampling distribution. This is straight from the formula card, as you can see here. Uh, and the mean, what this is saying is the mean of all of the x-bars, because this distribution, the sampling distribution, is the distribution of x-bars. That's, that's really what it's. The sampling distribution of sample means is what we call it, uh, but the sample mean we represent by an x-bar. So this is the distribution of x-bars, and this is saying the mean for the entire distribution of x-bars is just mu. Uh, the textbook, your textbook, um, says mu of x when it means the population distribution, because the population distribution is not x-bars, but it's just x. Um, and so the population distribution that's centered on mu and has a standard deviation of sigma is looking at raw data values, the distribution of all x values. Uh, and so here you, you really can just kind of ignore um, the subscript of x in the textbook um, and say that, that this is just means the population mean and the population standard deviation. Uh, so the mean of the distribution of x bars is just the population mean, like we talked about right here on this slide. Um, right here, 
uh, and right here. So the mean is just the population mean. And then the standard deviation is sigma divided by the square root of n. If we don't happen to know sigma, we can estimate sigma with s. So we could do s divided by the square root of m as well. Now, we will have occasion to use the z-score on these distributions. And the z-score formula alters in the same way that our mean and our standard deviation have altered. So our mean is actually not different at all. It's still just mu, um, like our formula has here. But our standard deviation now is sigma divided by the square root of n, of course. And anytime you have a complicated numerator or a complicated denominator, be sure you're putting parentheses around that complicated numerator or denominator. They've actually already done it in the textbook formula for the z-score. So I don't have the textbook formula for the z-score written again on the formula card, although really, if you look under chapter 9, I think that it's pretty close to there or, or literally there for the z-score formula under chapter 9 because uh, we'll use it then too. But you can take the chapter 2 formula and a data value in this distribution is x bar um, because remember, we're not doing the distribution of x's anymore. We're doing the distribution of sample means or x bars. And then, of course, the mean of all sample means is mu, and the standard deviation of all the sample means is this sigma divided by the square root of n. So when you plug all of that in, when you adapt the chapter 2 formula to be friendly for sampling distributions of sample means, then this is the formula that you get. So you take the sample mean, you subtract the population mean, and you divide it, all of that, by sigma over the square root of n. Uh, and so, uh, remember that the mean of all z-scores is 0, and the standard deviation of all z-scores is 1, uh, and we call the distribution of z-scores is called the, the standard normal distribution, and it's, it's the one that's pictured right here, um, where you have the mean is 0 and the standard deviation is 1, so that it levels off at 3 and negative 3, because all or nearly all of our data are going to be within three standard deviations of the mean. And then let's uh, look at some advantages of the sampling distribution. So here we would call this a roughly uniform, very flat distribution. There's some variability, but it's a roughly uniform distribution. And whenever you have a distribution of the sampling distribution, but your sample size is 1, that's going to be exactly equal, exactly the same thing as your population distribution. Uh, because if you plug in n equals 1, it's just going to be the same thing as your, your population distribution. So um, this is what the population distribution looks like originally. It is a flat, uniform distribution. But you see that as our sample size increases, the sampling distribution becomes this nice, normal, bell-shaped curve, or the normal distribution. It gets close enough to normal for us to be allowed to do all the stuff that we did back in chapter 6. And that's really our goal, to be able to use normal CDF and inverse norm. We want it to be close enough. Uh, and then let's look at a couple more distributions. Here we have a right skew distribution, uh, or what was probably originally, because we're just at sample size 2. Here we have what was originally a multimodal distribution. Um, but you'll see as we get larger and larger and larger, our uh, right skew distribution and our normal distri our, uh, our multimodal distribution both become these nice normal bell-shaped curves. Uh, and so you're like, well, okay, only 10 was required for the previous one. Here it looks like 25 was required. N of 30 is usually enough. Uh, so some distribution, it depends on how close your distribution is to a normal distribution to begin with. Really, the more skewed or the more outliers that you have, the larger your sample size that you're going to need to get it to be close enough to normal for us to be good to go. Um, so uh, if you have, you should always look at your data if you can to see if it, what the original data set looked like. Was it extremely skewed? Did it have a lot of outliers? Um, but if not, a sample size of 30 is more than enough to say, yep, we're sure that this is going to be normal. And that's called the central limit theorem. And it's central to all that we're going to do in chapters 8 and 9, which is considered kind of the 
heart and soul of statistics. So this is a really, really important concept, the central limit theorem telling us that our sampling distributions are going to be normal once we get at least 30 data values or more. And with that in mind, we can go and work some problems like we did last time. We're going to have a three-step process again. First, drawing the curve, and if you've already printed out the document, the draw me a picture document, then you've already gotten that done. The second thing is labeling and shading, and then the third thing is calculate. Uh, don't forget, though, that we have that sigma over the square root of n when we go to calculate. And if you have uh, adjusted your draw me a picture document correctly uh, already, then you will already have replaced sigma with sigma over the square root of n. Um, and this, keep in mind, is the distribution of x bars instead of uh, just the normal population distribution. So these uh, data values won't represent a single data value on our line, but they will represent a mean of a whole bunch of data values, whatever our sample size is, the mean of that many data values. And so let's jump into a couple of examples. Uh, here we have exactly the same scenario as before, except now we're going to be looking at averages of 32 students at a time. So we're going to assume these were not just one classroom, but randomly collected 32 students taken at a time. Uh, so we've got the, our exam average of 77.5, our standard deviation of 11.5. What is the probability that an average of 32 students would have a score less than 70, that that average would be less than 70. Uh, and so, of course, we're going to want to start with our picture. Um, and on our picture, we would want uh, the mean to be 77 and a half, and we'd want less than 70. But, of course, keep in mind this is an X bar of less than 70. Um, and not just a normal data value. That's why I've put it over so far, um, is because this is an X bar or a mean. Um, normally I would have probably put it pretty close to the 77 and a half, but this is a mean of 32 data values, so uh, um, that changes how spread out our data is um, and makes a difference. And so because it's less than 70, uh, a probability, going back to the um, probability of being less than 70, then I'm going to shade to the left. And there I have it. And then, of course, probability is going to be equal to the area, and that's above the belt, so that means I want to use normal CDF. Ooh, I have that wrong. We don't want to multiply by 100%. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so I get stuff wrong, too. Uh, you already knew that, I'm sure. And so just ignore that. That's percentage, right? Um, so we want probability, so we do not want to multiply by 100%. Uh, and we do want the rest of this, though, I believe, right? Uh, so the minimum of our shaded region is going to be negative 1E99, and that's what I have. The maximum of our shaded region is going to be 70. Our mean is 77 and a half. And then our standard deviation, we definitely don't want to forget to divide by the square root of n. Here our n is 32, um, so sigma was 11 and a half divided by the square root of 32. So let's put all of that in. Um, I'm going to get rid of the ink, so, uh, but don't forget not to multiply by 100%. Maybe I'll edit that uh, here so that your lecture notes won't have that incorrectly done on there. Um, and so, second DISTR to get to normal CDF. Option two, normal CDF. Um, oh, we already have negative 1899. I want to change that to 70. 77.5 um, and 11.5 divided by the square root of 32. And then I'm going to close that parenthesis and paste. Make sure everything looks good. Negative 1, 8, 9, 9, 70, 77.5, 11.5 divided by square root of 32. And, oh, that's a tiny number. Um, so really, this is way bigger than it should have been. Uh, what this number is, uh, when we have E negative 4, that means take this decimal and move it this way. 
So one, uh, so we moved it one, and then we would do two, three, four. So we would have three zeros. So if we did point zero point zero 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 one two four eight seven nine three nine one. Um, yeah, so, oh, I didn't write it exactly right because it should be 1, 2, um, but that's okay. The thing I wanted to show you is that the three zeros becomes e negative 4. Um, so this is, this is a tiny number. It's point zero 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 one one two um, for, well, we could just say 5 there. Um, or really, we could just stop at the 112 because that's three significant digits. But 0. 0.000112 is the probability. Almost zero. I mean, that's a very small probability. So uh, that's one question done. And then uh, assume exam scores are normally distributed with a mean of 77.5 and a standard deviation of 11.5. What is the average score of 32 students that would be below 40% of the other average scores of that same size? So the thing that I would want to ask myself is, is this the 40th percentile? Um, so we're looking at an average score, um, and we want it to be below 40% of other average scores. So um, let's say that this is these are my scores. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and put the score that I'm looking for here, this average score, this X bar that we're looking for. And it says that my score is below 40%. So does that mean the 40% is on this side? I don't think it does because then my score would be above. Um, so if the 40% were here, then my score is above that 40%, not below. So really the 40% needs to be on this side because my score is below 40% of, of other average scores. Well, we know we need 100% total, so this on right here should be 60%. Um, so if I'm below 40% of scores, uh, then there's good news, I'm above 60% of scores, so I'm above average, so that's pretty good. So I would always use these pictures to make sure that these, especially these tricky ones, this one's a tricky one, um, especially these tricky ones make sense. So, you know, use your picture as a check and say, is this really drawing what it says that it is? Um, and so that's what we want here. So when we go to draw our picture, of course, we're going to put 77 and a half in the middle. Um, but the thing that we want to find is going to be uh, this value right here. Uh, where we'll have 40% to the right. And if we have 40% to the right, then as we said before, um, we should have 60% to the left. Uh, and so I'm going to do inverse norm, uh, and I could actually put this in the calculator, let it compute the, the 0.60. I, I am able to do that arithmetic on my own, though, even though I kind of suck at arithmetic. I, even though I really suck at arithmetic, I can... I'm, able to do this after lots of 40, 48 years of practice. I'm able to do this uh, on my own without the use of a calculator. Most things, though, I do want to use a calculator for. Um, and then 77 and a half is our mean, and our standard deviation is 11 divided by square root of 3. Now, we're using inverse norm here because we want to find the score, the average, the sample mean for which um, there's, uh, it's below 40% of other scores. Uh, so the thing that we're trying to find is something that we would label below the belt, and that's the opposite of normal boxing rules. So inverse norm is why we're using inverse norm here. So let's go and plug all this in and uh, get the answer. So second DISDR option three this time. Area to the left, let me just go ahead and plug in one minus um, 0.40. Uh, my mean is 77 and a half, and my standard deviation is 11.5 divided by the square root of 32, and closing that parenthesis. And I'm just going to leave that as left because that's what I think most of you have on your calculator. And then enter, uh, and that gives me a score of 78.0. Um, 
zero two. So almost seventy eight exactly. So it's not very far away um, that you from the the fiftieth percentile that we get the sixtieth percentile. And the reason for that is, of course, we're dividing by the square root of thirty two. So let's just look at if um, this is a good question. If we were asked what's the the standard deviation of this distribution, it would be eleven point five divided by the square root of 32. And you will be asked these types of questions. You'll be asked, what's the mean of the sampling distribution? Well, the mean of the sampling distribution is just 77 and a half, um, and that's from this formula that we talked about earlier. It's the, same as, it's the same as the population mean. But if we're asked the standard deviation of this distribution, then we've got to divide by the square root of n. So I've taken my original sigma, and I'm dividing by the square root of my n here um, to get the standard deviation of this distribution. And whoops, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to hit enter here. And that gives me two. So my standard deviation is just um, 2.03. Um, so it's just a tiny amount that I have one standard deviation. And remember, one standard deviation on either side of the mean is 68% of your data. So you would say 68% of the sample means would be uh, between 75.5 and 79.5 approximately. It's a little little less and a little more because you've got the 0.03 part. Um, but it's very, very close to 75.5 and 79.5, and you would have 68% of your sample means in that area. So that's that's a huge amount um, to have in that area. And so those are a couple of examples from this sampling distribution section. So uh, hopefully that all makes sense. And as you work on your discussions, as you work on your homework, as you work on your projects and your quizzes, don't forget your formula card is your number one resource. Even though the two formulas in here are simple, it's a nice reminder to say, hey, the mean of x bars is just mu. And hey, the sigma uh, divided by, or the standard deviation of the sampling distribution is this sigma divided by the square root of m, the biggest secret to this chapter. Um, remembering that instead of sigma, our standard deviation is sigma divided by the square root of n. So the formula card reminds you of both those things. And then your calculator will be useful, especially when you go to do the normal CDF and inverse norm types of problems that you'll have. Uh, your lecture notes will hopefully be very helpful, especially as you take notes on top of them. And then your textbook and Newton instruction have some nice examples in them that might be very helpful uh, for you in this chapter. And if all of that fails, you can always message me. So I wish you the very best of luck on this chapter. Good luck.